Good morning and welcome to Madeira. Today we are going to be exploring Funchal, the capital city, on two feet, but we're also hoping to take in a few unique public transport methods too. We've wandered along the main promenade and it's stunning with really brightly coloured tropical flowers and they've also got the bird of paradise which is Madeira's national flower. Loads of lizards as well and so many of them that they started like angering one another and they're like chasing one another and getting in one another's way. So it's quite cool to watch on as those guys were just scurrying around. And we've made our way along to the cable car, which is what we're now riding. We'd hoped to do this yesterday and it was like at the 11th hour that we realized that the toboggan that we want to do from the top wasn't running yesterday on a Sunday. And so luckily we realized before we bought the tickets and it was heaving full of people. And this morning when we've come just after it's opened, there were a couple of other people but we haven't had to queue for anything and what it's meant is that we've actually ended up with our own gondola. You are supposed to wear face masks but the lady just said to us you can take off the face masks and I guess that's because we're in our own one at the moment and so it's actually been really rather blissful so this would be a top tip get here nice and early you can get a gondola to yourself you don't have to stand in a queue and the views out over Madeira or Funchal more aptly are brilliant from up here. Madeira has several cable cars and the one that we've taken has put us up into the neighbourhood of Monte and up here there is the Monte Palace Tropical Gardens. It's on a really steep hillside and you can just hear the gushing of the water. On first impressions it's really reminding me of Bodnant Gardens which we went to last year in North Wales and it's just really stunning on first impressions and not only am I really pleased that we got up and out really early to be able to beat the queues and get our own cabin in the cable car but we're also realizing that these gardens at this time are also pretty much empty. I definitely say it's worth it getting up nice and early and getting this place to yourselves. It's just coming up to half past 10 and the heat has well and truly risen and it is feeling really quite hot even in this sort of slightly shaded part with bits of dappled sunlight coming through. When you get into the deepest parts of the valley where there are the gushing streams, the heat just dies off almost immediately. And we've also come across pockets where there's been butterflies all fluttering around. I'm not too sure if they're like doing some kind of mating dance or if they're just playing with one another, but it's been quite cool just to watch on. terraces above you look down and it just looks like koi pond but when you actually get to this level it's more like an aquarium where they've got windows so you can see them up close. palace within the gardens was in fact a hotel and it was a hotel until the owner died back in 1947. It remained I guess like unowned until 1987 when someone else bought it and then turned it into these gorgeous gardens but I think because of how long it had remained without anyone really taking care of this place it needed a lot of work doing to it to get it into the state that we can enjoy it in today. I 
I said before that this place was reminding me a little bit of Bodmin Gardens, but this part of it is really reminding me of the Valhalla Museum in the Tresco Abbey Gardens, because it's gardens, but then there's a bit where you've got these wooden figurines really brightly painted, and it just looks really similar. Obviously, they're just not the ship fronts. We've left the gardens and just a few minutes walk around the bend in the road here's the top of where the toboggans set off. The queue here is quite epically long but we figure where else in the world can you do this? It's going to cost us 30 euros for two of us to be able to take the toboggan part of the way down the hill and then I think we're just planning on wandering from the end point back into downtown of Franchal. No. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Potholes! <laughs> there's been people in the middle of the road. I don't think there's been any cars, have there? No, not yet. O only parked cars? Yeah. ride was everything that I hoped it was going to be. I knew it was going to be super cheesy and touristy but to me I just don't know of anywhere else in the world where you might be able to do something like that. If you do know somewhere do let me know in the comments below because that might need to be my next trip. Yes we had to wait in a queue for quite some time but then as soon as we got to the front and we were ready it was a case of we were just like in and we were gone. They did have to stop really briefly just to oil the bottom of the sled and I think it was just because if you don't oil it regularly Regularly, it won't slip slide down the tarmac quite so easily. So they just took out a rag and they ran the toboggan over it on one side and then they flipped it onto the other side of the toboggan and again they ran the toboggan over that. There were two professional photographers on the way down so I guess if we looked terrible in one of the photographs they would just use the other one. They also had someone stopping traffic at a crossroads and we did actually see them stopping traffic and as soon as we'd gone the person was like go go go. When we got to the bottom they already had those photographs printed out and I'm not normally one for going for those photographs it was 10 euros but as I say where else am I ever going to be able to get a photograph of us riding a toboggan down a public road with vehicles on it so yep yeah, I sucked that up and I bought it and it seemed like a really well-oiled machine at the very end to the people who came down the hill with us on the back. They needed to load their toboggan onto a truck of some description. And then once they put it onto the truck right next door to it, there was a coach and all of those people were then riding that bus to get back up to the top. The toboggans went back up to the top on a truck. They had loads of really old fashioned photographs from back in history where you could see some people actually having to put that sledge or toboggan over their heads and carry it back up the hill which just seems crazy to me. Once you get to the end as well as all of the photographs, cafe, souvenir tat shops, they've also got a row of taxis and it's 10 euros per taxi to come back down the hill into Funchal or alternatively 10 euros to take you back up to the top of Monte if you bought a return on the cable car. Um, we haven't and we are more than happy walking from the end of the toboggan back down into Funchal so we're doing that at the moment to be able to save us 10 euros but right now we're super hungry so we're on the lookout for somewhere to go eat. After consuming a ridiculously cheap breakfast consisting of a huge ham and cheese sandwich and a coffee, we set off on the walking tour around Funchal. 
We visited all sorts from the Funchal Cathedral with its intricate ceiling made from local Madeiran wood, embellished with ivory inserts, to getting up high to look down onto the city. We learned that the buildings with the tower-like sections were often occupied by the wine owners, as they could be the first to spot when ships came in and be the first at the port to sell their goods. But perhaps most surprisingly, my favourite site was the English church. When it was built, Portuguese law prohibited an external building from looking like a church. Sir Henry Vitch designed a building reminiscent of a library or a lecture hall. It was undergoing renovations when we visited, but one of the builders very kindly let us have a quick peek inside. After a little rest back up at our hostel, we headed out with our stomachs suitably empty. Thankfully, the food tour began with a surprisingly big meal made up of tuna fish, sweet potato, polenta, and the fish known as black scabbard. It's seemingly innocent on the plate when served traditionally with the small Madeira banana, but truly terrifying fish when you see it whole in the supermarket. Thankfully, it lives at a depth of about a thousand meters, so wild swimming later in our trip wasn't off the cards. Next, we visited the Mercado dos Lavradores where we were taken to a quiet area upstairs away from any hard selling, where we had a small plate to taste traditional Madeiran fruits. Some were quite sour, not to my liking, such as the red pitanga and the tamarillo, through to the delightfully sweet banana, which is smaller than most around the world, resulting in a strong sugary taste. After the fruit tasting, we made our way downstairs, past elegant flower stalls to a chocolate shop that was a kaleidoscope of colours. I had a coffee and a couple of their decadent chocolates. The green and pink one being made up of the Madeiran honey that's made from their sugar cane. We next visited Fabrica Santo Antonio, a magnificent old world feeling shop selling cookies and the Madeira cane honey cake, Bolo de Mel. Something that we learnt is popular around Christmas time and should always be torn, never cut. Next up was Pastor Donata or Portuguese egg custard tart. Deliciously sweet and creamy on the inside and crispy on the outside. One of my favourite foods whilst visiting Madeira. To finish, we went to a bar meant for trying poncha, but because it's made with rum, I instead went with a non-alcoholic Nikita. It's a sweet and tropical pineapple drink with ice cream, not too dissimilar to a virgin pina colada. If you've enjoyed this video, I'd be most grateful if you'd hit the like button and please consider subscribing to my channel as we spend the next few months exploring the island of Madeira from its many waterfalls, hikes along its beautiful lavadas, sunrises, foggy forests, epic coastlines and so much more.